What episode is this? Oh, I think this is number nine. All right? We're recording. I think right. it's nine, Joe. Should I double check just so uh, be sure? But I believe Vanessa was number eight last week. I think you might be right. No, Vanessa's was number seven. This is number eight. Episode eight of This Week in the Grotto, and we are going to each be putting together what we would call our perfect workout. We're going to pick 10 exercises each that would constitute a perfect workout for the general population exerciser to tone their muscle. So we definitely need to define the word toning. But before we get into this week's topic, we have to pick a winner for our Evolve Buffalo Keychain giveaway. And this week's winner is Rachel Joyner. She left us a Facebook review and it reads as such. It says, I would certainly recommend UEB to anyone willing to work hard toward their goals, anyone wanting to meet some of the kindest and most supportive people, and anyone not afraid to sweat. Jill and Jeff are knowledgeable and passionate and it shows through what they have built at the Grotto. Lucky to have found this home away from home. Well, oh, we're lucky nice. to have you, Rachel, as well as your husband, Matt, and all the fine people at U Evolve Buffalo. So there will be a keychain at the Grotto for you tomorrow morning. She, she'll probably be there, right? Yep, she's there at uh, six thirty in the morning on Saturday. Fantastic, Rachel! Pick up your keychain. Thanks for the great review. Um, we will be announcing ne on next week's podcast the details to our spring lean program, lifestyle, exercise, and nutrition. As we are wrapping up our New Year's lean program this week, we're going into the final week. Um, it was a great eight weeks, a lot of participation. Uh, we've been very busy. Classes have been busy. Everybody putting in a lot of hard work. So we're going to wrap that up. And then in about four weeks, we'll be starting our spring one. And so We had a great, a great, um, I think that I would say that this has been collectively as a whole, just thinking about all of the different groups. I would say that this has probably been the most active. Is that the word I want to use? Yeah, as far as uh, people being consistent with their with their training yeah. throughout the yeah. week, week in and yeah. week out. Yeah, the the classes um, very people have definitely been very consistent, and it's nice to see because it's great to see for us because I'm sure that. I don't know, or maybe they do or don't um, see the progression in even just their motor patterns, because the people who maybe just started, we had a lot of new faces that started in January, and you can see even just the difference in their in their movements and how they're able to um, effectively execute these exer exercises. Um, you can see the different in their strength, their body composition. Oh, for sure. Um, it, I can't wait for some of these side by sides. I had um, during rush hour, I had Jan, Jen Mann right in front of me, and we were doing overhand bent over rows. And I feel like those are just a good, you can definitely see the definition in people's shoulders with those, but just the way the, the difference from her very beginning, because she was new with us in, in January. And um, I said to her, I go, oh my gosh, I go, do you have any idea how different you look? And she was kind of like, oh no, not really. I mean, I think she does in a certain way, but I don't think that she sees and notices what we do from a professional standpoint. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, definitely so I'm really excited. We've had a, a really good group, but I'm, I know that I'm really excited for all of them um, and all the progress that they made. And I know we have a lot, a lot of people continuing into that spring program. Um, so it'll be pretty awesome to see 
not only where they've come from January until the end of this first round, but also as we get to um, right before that Memorial Day weekend. So that'll give them about a five solid months. And uh, I'm excited for everybody. The, um, just a word of warning to everyone, it's those three to four weeks in between the programs that you wanna make sure that you uh, keep up with things and you don't let the, the cheese slip off the cracker, get, get off of your diet, lose that consistency. So we've obviously, we put some measures in place um, to help people at least more economically keep their, keep their training going. On the interim, we have the lean in between. We have, and then for people that aren't even in the lean program, we had a, a nice all uh, unlimited class package special that we ran. Um, so still some great opportunities for everyone to just be uh, consistent with their training. Uh, the schedule, you know, we've added some things to the schedule, moved a few things around, try to optimize the time slots that we have available for people to train. So make sure you check all that stuff out. Um, you give Buffalo. What is on the dockets? We're almost in March. Today's uh, February 21st. So what's on yeah, the horizon? I, that happened. I feel like I just blinked. I feel like I blinked and all of a sudden we're almost in March. So we still have um, the fight for air climb. I know that we have quite a few people who have already joined the team. That is um, through the American Lung Association. We've actually partnered up with them um, and are doing like a sponsorship. Anyone that signs up for the air climb, they get um, 12 class passes that they can use that they expire the day of the climb, but they can come in, use the class passes, start building up some strength and endurance um, to kind of gear up for that climb. But the actual date of the climb is going to be March 21st. That is a Saturday, um, and I believe it's 62 or 64 flights of stairs. It is definitely a interesting, um, an interesting event, I would say for sure. It's different than probably anything else that I've ever done before, um, including, uh, uh, you know, the, the 5Ks, the half marathon, any of the powerlifting meets. It's just something that's very different, a different sense of accomplishment. I think the money goes to a good cause um, and promotes, um, you know, a, a good, good information and in making sure that, you know, the people that we're spreading the word about lung diseases and illnesses. And is this the um, second or third year that you're doing that? Is this your third year? This is the, this is, I actually did it about five, five years ago. So this would actually be collectively um, the second year, but I have, I actually won't be able to attend this one personally. Our You Give Buffalo team is, um, but I am out of town for a uh, uh, cheerleading competition with Bella's Buffalo MV team. But um, I have done four of them in the past. So it's definitely, it's definitely an experience. <laughs> I will say that much. Cool. So anybody, so am I correct in thinking that anybody that registers, no matter where you're from, is yeah. entitled to those uh, 12 UEB classes? Yep. So anybody who signs up, they are actually, I think we're, we're right on their sponsorship. If you go to the Fight for Air Climb Buffalo Facebook page, they are, um, they've been telling everybody on as they register that they can, um, they have access to those class passes. And um, I think even through the emails and all of the registration. So they just have to, if somebody were to register, whether it's on our team or any other team, anybody that registers for the climb, they are, um, they're able to get those class passes. I just need their information, um, which Kaylin has been really good about making sure that she communicates with me so I can get these people into our mind body account to actually manually add the class passes for them. Fantastic. Good. I hope people really take advantage of that. So do I. I know we had quite a few people because um, we did this last year too. Um, it was 
a little bit with less, less notice um, because we kind of partnered up a little bit sooner. Rachel Joyner is on actually on the committee and for the Fight for Air Climb and also our You Give Buffalo um, committee as well. And she's the one who kind of linked us. Um, she was the one that linked us up. So I'm hoping now that people have had a little bit more, um, they know about it sooner that hopefully they'll come on in and use those passes. Absolutely. Uh, anything else we need to let people know about or should we get into uh, today's topic? Let's go for it. Okay, so what we were thinking is if we had to write, quote, the perfect workout for general population, which is most of the people that we deal with are, you know, it's a pretty broad demographic of people from, you know, I would say early 20s to maybe mid 60s, wide age range, men, women, um, a variety of fitness levels from beginner to intermediate. Um, you know, some people are, you know, at varying ends of the spectrum. But if we were to create a workout that would cover that general population with the accomplishment of, and again, I quote, toning, as opposed to endurance or gaining strength, strength training. So the word toning gets thrown around pretty loosely quite often uh, in the fitness industry. And I know most people that actually work in the fitness industry really don't like the word toning because of how um, ambiguous it is. It really, it really doesn't mean anything. There's no, I mean, people kind of like think they know what they mean when they say it, but for for our purposes today, let's, let's define toning. And I would start off by saying that it would be the removal of lowering your body fat to expose more of your, your muscle condition that you already have. And the workout in, in, in this case would be to either um, increase your pre-existing muscle mass or maintain what you already have. And the only way to really expose that would be, again, through lowering your body fat percentage, and that would come almost exclusively through uh, your diet, by right? changing your diet. Does that sound about right, Joan? I would say so, yep. Yeah, so when we say toning, in the context of today's, if, if to truly achieve toning in that sense of the term of showing more of your pre-existing muscle or improving upon that, it would have to be coupled with a proper nutrition plan, which we're not going to get into today. So for all intents and purposes, let's yeah, assume absolutely. that there's a proper nutrition plan in place and we will just focus on the workout portion of it. And we decided to pick 10 exercises each that we would choose. This was hard. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. I'm curious to see what you came. Now, Joe and I did not talk, you know, to each other at all about what we were, what we would choose other than that we would pick 10 exercises each and kind of lay it out there why we chose what we chose. Um, do you want to go do like all your 10 first, then my 10, or do you want to go one each back and forth? What do you think? Let's Joe? go one and one. Okay, so why don't you start, and then I'll kind of, whatever you pick, I'll kind of pick the matching, you know, something close to what, what you picked. As okay. far as with me, the body part or, or, or whatever. So what's, and, and I would say these are in no particular order. Yeah, no, right? yeah. I just, no, no, no particular order other than. I, uh, I actually kind of went by body part because I tried to hit at least, at least one exercise per body part. Sure. So I started with the bigger muscle groups and kind of worked my way down. Yeah, so did I. So go ahead. What did you come up All with? All right. So this, the part I think that I struggled with is in thinking about general fitness in trying to be mindful of um, exercises for people who may need modifications and that kind of thing as well. 
Yep. Um, so I tried to pick what I thought would be exercises that would be fitting for even those people who may need within reason, some type of modifications. Sure. I mean, exactly. this isn't to say that I don't think there's better exercises. I mean, they're clearly, oh, in agree. my opinion, are, but like, for instance, I, I just as an example, I didn't put pull-ups on there because I know nine out of 10 people or more can't do pull-ups. I'll actually, do you know what? I'm going to start right there. Cause I put, I paired them together. So I don't even know if this is fair. Cause I put two exercises as one. Um, for the people who can do pull-ups, I did put pull-ups or I put the body rows with the barbell. Okay. Yeah. So I like the, the so, modified, modified version. Yeah. So I put that modified body row on there. Um, and again, I feel like there's different, there's different um, progressions to build up to the pull-up, but for the people who actually can do it, whether it's with an assistance band or they are able to do it or even working a negative pull-up. So I guess just focusing on, even, even, if the, even for the people who can do pull-ups, there's even ways to make that body row a more advanced movement by elevating their feet. So maybe I could even just put that body row on so that way I'm not like doing the cheater of, I'm really going to end up with 20 exercises <laughs> instead right. of 10. So why don't I say the body row? Okay. What, what I did, I even simplified, and I agree with you a hundred percent that that's the, probably the superior, you know, pulling movement, you know, um, but I went with a bent over single arm row, just even a more simplified version. Cause I was, what I was thinking was if I had to, if I had one training, almost like if I had one training session with a person that I had yeah. to show this workout, you know, that I wouldn't have to keep, I, there, there would be very few modifications I would need to do to, to do a, a bent over row with someone. And then there's a lot of different, you know, varieties. You can use a dumbbell, you can use a kettlebell, you know, this, um, and then you can always modify the angle of the person's arm. But the most simplest form of a row that I came up with was just the bent over uh, single arm dumbbell row. So you had the body row and I, I came up with the single row. So pre pretty close to each other, some form of, of row. Really? Yeah, you can't go wrong there. That's, I mean, uh, a, a good pulling exercise is essential in, in really sure. any, any workout. So what, what was your second one, Jill? Um, I put box squats. I was kind of torn between, I, I don't think that I would, I certainly not in a first session would probably not do a barbell back squat. No. Um, just to, just so I would be able to gauge people's, um, motor patterns, their strength. Um, so I stuck actually with a box squat and, um, using either dumbbells or a kettlebell in a racked position. So that way it gives them the opportunity still to, or even just going simply from a low box and body weight, depending on what, you know, they tell me that their fitness level is, um, so I think by starting off with that in that box position, it also protects their knees a little bit. It gives them up an opportunity to um, get to a certain depth, which a lot of people um, generally seem to have a little bit difficulty getting to. So I think that they can go a little bit lower. It focuses, um, it protects their knees a little bit. And then also too in keeping the weight, you can kind of manage the weight a little bit. It also works their core in having to make sure that they aren't collapsing or heaving forward. So I put the goblet squat and as soon as you said box squat, I said, I knew I should, I should have put the box squat. <laughs> so I, I would say, even though I put the goblet squat, the, the better idea is, is the box squat. Um, that was definitely um, an oversight on on my part. I like the I goblet. Was the goblet between the two because I like goblet squats. I'm sorry. I said I was actually torn between the two. I had I had um, 
I was considering both of them and kind of going between the pros and cons because like I said, there's no way in just a general first term, there was no way that I was going to do a barbell back squat, even though like if you're talking about superiority standpoint overall, maybe that's the better for somebody who knows the movement. But when it came down to it, I was torn between the goblet squat and the box squat, but it was just that the simplicity of basically just telling people you need to sit down and I want you to stand up. We're going to focus on keeping your core tight and strong, make sure that you're not leaning forward, really drive up through those legs, push through the heels, the center of your feet. And it's just, it's even a movement that they could do at home if they wanted to start doing something and they could, they could also be able to execute it safely. Sure. And you can always modify the depth of the box. And yeah, absolutely. I think, um, of of course, as a lower body, uh, staple, um, the box squat is, is a winner for sure. Very good call there. Okay. That's two. What do you got for number three? So this was one that I was doing a, a, like a stiff leg deadlift or just a basic deadlift, um, partially because it just takes so much time to actually per, per, um, to perfect that deadlift movement. And it could be very time consuming if it's somebody who maybe isn't able to catch on quite as quickly. Mm-hmm. So I actually think that maybe a the, the, the Romanian deadlift, stiff leg deadlift might be a better option just because it doesn't seem to, people seem to understand and catch on to it a little bit better than the actual, like an actual barbell conventional style deadlift. I, I came up with the same thing. There was no way I was going to put as much as I love the deadlift as, as an exercise for a general, general fitness. I wasn't uh, going to put that in there. So I went with the stiff leg deadlift and I almost reluctantly went with the stiff leg deadlift because I almost thought that can sometimes uh, be a little hard to coach at the beginning yeah. too, as far as mm-hmm. getting people to hinge their hips and not just sure. over bend their knees and squat it down. But I mean, that's our job. So we have to assume that we got to put a little elbow grease into um, training the person. So I, I agree. And I came up with the exact same thing, the, the stiff leg deadlift for number three. Yeah. Plus I wanted to get a little more because of the squat, <clears throat> you know, we had the squat and I wanted something a little bit more on the, on the backside of the body, the posterior chain. So um, and plus it, it, it does work your upper, your upper back and body too. Um, mm-hmm. it's a great, um, exercise for the entire backside of the body. So, yeah. Good call. Stiff leg or Romanian deadlift, um, at number three. Got three. All right. All right. So we're on number four. This would be four, yeah. Uh, so just going down, this was another, I chose another leg exercise. So did that. It's, I chose a single leg squat. Um, I didn't want to do lunges because I think that it puts too much pressure on people's knees if they're not able to do it correctly. When you're in that single leg, um, that split position, people, you can show them to go down. And I noticed that when people lunge, especially in a forward lunge, if they're unfamiliar with the movement, they go too far to where they end up pushing through their knee too forward and they push through their toe instead of through the center of their foot or heel. So they're not really activating the right, the right muscles because they're not performing the exercise correctly. So by staying in that single legs, that single leg squat position, Um, it gives them an opportunity to focus on doing the movement correctly. I think it's a little bit safer for your knee joints. Um, and then I think that you're actually then activating the muscles correctly. I came up with the exact same thing. I I put lunge slash single leg squat 
So just depending on the person's um, level of competency or even flexibility, mobility, um, sure. easily do a, a walking lunge or a stationary lunge, but the more simplified version of just going into that split leg stance and just up and down repetitions on, on the single leg squat one side at a time. Um, yeah. I definitely and wanted, with... I'm sorry. Um, and, and I think we we're on the same lines of putting three lower body exercises, um, yeah. being it, you know, a whole half of the body can at least put some extra work down there. So you have the, you know, your squat, box squat, um, the stiff leg deadlift for the, the posterior side, and then a s split um, single leg squat really co covers everything, including the core and balance. Yeah, the balance coordination. So, I mean, and even if you wanted to take that single leg a step further and more advanced, if you go into that Bulgarian split squat with your that rear foot elevated for somebody who's a little bit more advanced, because then you could always, to adjust the where the hip is hinged or you're upright and then it kind of hits either a more um the more hamstring and glute or yeah. a uh more quad dominant depending on how you're angled and then also to where you hold the weight if you choose to use weight whether it's on the forward on the outside or on the inside that can also change it too so there's definitely a lot of opportunity depending on somebody's um fitness level that could be used for that. And then also to even like we talked about the stiff leg deadlift, as much as it's, uh, um, you know, in the posterior chain and your, your hamstrings and your glutes, you do, like we talked about, you also get a bit of your upper back in there as well. And, and your lower back, just the way that you're hinging. So it really could actually be. And if you think about, you know, I always tell people I, to focus in any of the movement, movements, that they need to make sure that they're protecting their back with every single thing that they're doing, that we can't be, that even if it's a lower body exercise, you still need to be focusing on your upper body just as much in order to keep everything safe and protected. So if that's the case, you're still getting, even as you're hinging down, you're still getting even a little bit of that core work in as well. Oh, of course, yeah. Even with the, the single leg squat, if oh there, yeah, for if sure. There are balance issues, or even with so the lunge. The I'm sorry. So you're not doing. I always tell people, I go, you need to stay focused on your upper body, so you don't turn into a weeble wobble. Right. So the the coaching cue that I give is find your balance through your upper body, not your lower body. Let your lower body do the work, but find your balance through your upper body. So chest forward, shoulders back, back straight, core tight. Yep. And brace your breathing. And whichever direction your head goes, your body is going to follow. So if you're looking right. down over your knee, that's, and th right. this is with anything, any like uh, wrestling, that's why they're always trying to control the head. Whichever way the head goes, the body's just, if you turn the guy's head to the right, guess which way his body's going to go? To the right. If you crank his head to the left, you're going to pull his body to the left. Boxing, mm -hmm. same thing. If you want to turn the guy's body, you hit him in the, whichever direction you want him to go that the head is always going to take the weeds. So no different than exercise. People must so, think that we're like a broken record because the exact same thing. I always tell people, I'm like, don't, if anything, try to look forward straight out. Or even if you keep your gaze just slightly above eye level. So that way you're not, you know, like, it, like you just said, you look down, that's where your body is going to be inclined to, to lean towards. Yeah. So it's always the balance and, and another problem with the balance, even if you may be doing everything right with your upper body posture, and the most common um, thing that I come across where people have a hard time with balance is the sneakers that they're wearing. They're just those usually too much rubber soles, thick, chunky rubber. And I can see their foot on that rubber pad. And I got a story. They're, they're not, <clears throat> there's no way they can uh, balance because they're, their foot's not on a solid surface. They're either no, it, the heel is say much higher than the forefoot, so you're already in in an elevated. You're like you're like trying to train in high heel shoes, and then it's right. rubber on top of it. It's not even a hard surface. And people I know they make fun of my shoes because I wear the real flat minimalist shoes, but I'm never out of balance. And even if if 
if I were, were to wear those thick, chunky sneakers, if I'm doing a very heavy barbell curl, I can feel when that bar is I'm curling and that weight's getting in front of me, I can feel my center of gravity shift to the front. So a lot yeah. of times, even if you are doing everything right from an anatomical point of view, um, your shoes can be throwing you off big league. Yeah. And you know, people don't think about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw Matt under the bus just cause it's, it's kind of one of these, I guess, backhanded things. So he was squatting. I had, he was doing heavy squats. I remember, do you remember a few weeks ago when I said, is this, you know, is this what you prescribe Matt to do? And I, and he even, he ended up cutting it off. And I, I'm sure that he told you about it, mm -hmm. but I was watching him and I was like, your feet are caving in. I go, I, you, I go, you never do that. I go, I go, and you usually squat barefoot. What are you wearing? I mean, they, and there were those black ones with that red and I, it must've took at least 30 pounds off his squat. And to the point where, I mean, he, he ended up calling it because he was supposed to do like a set, a set of five. And I think he got to two or three. And I was like, this is not, this is, I'm like, you're not, you're going to get hurt. Let's just call this for the day. Come back. You know, we're going to do this instead. But so then he ended up coming back the next day, came back and did his squats barefoot and everything was back to normal. His form was better. His knees weren't caving in. His ankles and feet weren't caving in. And I go, Matt, I go, yesterday from yesterday today, it's like, you're a completely different, you're a completely different squatter. Yeah. The movement does, didn't even look the same. Like he couldn't even execute the movement the way that I know that he's capable of because he had those shoes on. And I said to him, I go, you, you usually squat barefoot. Those are definitely not what you want to be wearing because you're, you look like a, a drunken sailor. <laughs> Don't have hundred dollar sneakers in a 10 cent squat. Yeah. And it's <laughs> in, I mean, he just, he's, it was just so odd to see though, because he doesn't, he's got the movement down. He's really been working hard at it for quite some time now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got the work. depth. He's got the strength. So, so to see him struggle at like 175, 185, I was like, let's, let's revisit this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's not. The shoes, the shoes do make a difference. All right, so we got four in. Yeah, this would be number right? five. All right, so. Uh, not to um, interrupt, but was that the end of the, basically for the lower body? Yep. Do you have any, any more lower body movements or no? No, that was the end of my lower body. I kind of, after those, um, those three lower body movements, I stuck with those. I had other ones in mind, um, but for the sake of only having 10 and yeah. trying to make it a full body workout, I kind of cut it off there. So did I, just so we're on the same page. Okay. Um, so I already, we already talked about body rows and I kind of used the stiff leg deadlifts as a back exercise as well. So that was one back exercise. The rows we covered as a back exercise. So my next one, um, I picked dumbbell chest presses just because as much as I like a barbell, I don't think that everyone necessarily has the strength. It's easier for people to, um, when we're talking about motor patterns, I think people have a little bit easier of a time with a pair of dumbbells. And I would actually say too, instead of even putting them on a bench, sometimes putting beginners on a floor level makes it a little bit easier too, just to kind of control their range of motion to make sure that they're not getting too much depth. So it's not too much, uh, too taxing on the shoulder. And then it also gives you an opportunity to make sure that they're just focusing on that movement and keep, it seems like people are able to stabilize the dumbbells a little bit better. For sure. I, I did almost the same thing. I did a dumbbell chest press, but I said on a low incline. So just one notch up on an adjustable bench, which will put you at about 15 degrees uh, for a couple reasons. One, I think a, a, a beginner generally with that slight incline seems to find the pocket of where to place the dumbbells 
just a little bit easier because in my experience, they generally try to put them too far back into their shoulders to begin with. So by sure. putting them on that little bit of an incline, it kind of sets, sets it's a, a, an easier adjustment to get them in, in the proper position. And in general, it's gonna target just a little more of the upper chest, which is where mm -hmm. most people probably need most of the work anyway. And, but not too high. That's why I said just one notch, because especially a beginner will end up overloading their shoulders like you already oh, mentioned. Um, yep. and, and then, of course, if it was somebody that was um, completely green, then I would, I would go to possibly a floor press. But assuming that there's some level of um, proficiency with the movement, I would put them on the, the lower. That's end. definitely a movement that you can really notice how robotic people can be because they get to like, like a, do you know what I mean? Sure. The two, the two coaching cues that I use for the chest press when I want people to bring their arms down to maybe like a 45 degree angle to get the yeah. weight, make sure it's over the chest and they're not into their, into their neck and shoulders is yeah, I have them. Goal post. What's that? I said, I tell people, don't turn yourself into a field goal post. You want to tuck your elbows in just a little bit with that. This would be a field goal post. Well, not if you're no. laying down on your back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but I stand them up right across from me, directly across from me. And I tell them, okay, me and you are chirping each other. And you're going to push me over. Right, you're gonna now you've had enough of my mouth and you're gonna deck me. How are you gonna push me over? And you know what they do? They put their arms at 45 degrees and they go like this. And I'm like, and then I just I stop their hands. I'm like, that's your chest press, right there. You would never push me like this. You would know <laughs> instinctively where you're strongest, right across your chest. You're gonna break sure. your elbows in and you're gonna push me over. If your car, and then I, I might have them face a wall. I say, okay. Your car stalled on the side of the road. How are you going to push the car off? And you got to get it off, off the road. How are you going to push it? You're not going to crouch down and push like this. You're going to crouch down and push through the center of your body. That's your push up. That's your chest press. Instinctively, you know how to do that. You would know if you needed to harness that strength to push something or to push me, it shouldn't be any different than with your push up or your dumbbells. You're going to get into that. 45 degree position and you're going to harness the power through your core in the center of your chest. And then when that usually it clicks in and it doesn't take much adjusting after that because they have a visual cue. It makes cue. sense. Yeah. Cause then they can actually have a sense of a concrete example. Sure, they've done it before. To the what and the why. I think that sometimes explaining the why to people can be really beneficial and enticing to get them to do it correctly, yes. if that makes sense. You know, it's if they know why they're doing an exercise a certain way, um, I think they're more inclined to do it right. So that's actually a really good analogy, the shove or even getting, you know, like you're gonna push your car. Yeah. So. All right, so that was, that was one, two, three, four, that was number five? Yep. Yep, yep. Uh, since we're already on it, I actually have push-ups right on there. I didn't, I, I stayed away from the, 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 the push-up. Did you? I, I did because it's, I, it, I think it's hard to do them well. It's hard for a, a lot of people. Um, inevitably, it's going to take some, some modifications. Sure. Um, in, instead of putting another um, press motion. I actually went with the, um, a band pull apart I to put another that. exercise on the, on the backside. So using like a TheraBand or you can use any kind of tube band, but just retracting the shoulders back and pulling it apart at either um, chest or shoulder height because I was thinking more of people's posture, especially mm -hmm. in this day and age with computers and cell phones and TVs and sitting and driving. And I just thought more prudent to put um, something that's going to 
retract the, the shoulders back. I and mean, we have the row, obviously. Um, sure. But this will get a little more into the center of the back. And if those muscles get strong, then inevitably the shoulders will hopefully start to retract. So I just did the, the, the op, I would say that's the opposite of, of the push up. Yeah. I actually thought about those band pull aparts too, because I think that those are, um, those are helpful in, like you said, the posture too, but also even when it comes to just doing like a basic, almost like a warm up move, just so that way people can get some kind of, you know, get, get the joint lubricated um, before they start actually lifting anything, get the muscles a little bit warmed, but not overly taxed. Um, so that was definitely the, those pull aparts were definitely in, in my thought process. The, the other uh, benefit of, I think the pull apart, why I, I like it so much, um, like I said, enough to, to make it a, a staple. And if not the pull apart, a face pull or something that's going to be retracting those shoulders awesome. back is that even your, say your, your push up, your chest press, um, most of these exercises, your squat, you're going to have to retract those shoulders back to get mm -hmm. into a good position. So even if you were going to squat with a barbell on your back, if your shoulders are too rounded forward, you're never going to get your arms back behind the bar to anchor I'm working with on somebody. Your back. You know, uh, a regular traditional barbell deadlift. You want to try to get your shoulders retracted back so you're not already starting in, a, in too round of a position because once you go to pull that weight, you're the next thing. If the you're shoulders... Already, yeah, you're already finger. compromised at that point. You know, if you're... We have, we have a client that we've been, I think, both been trying to work with on fixing the posture just because oh, okay. he's rounded forward. And I'm like, you need to every, every single class, I'm like, you need to pull your shoulders back. I'm like, pull your shoulders back and like try to like, almost like you're trying to push your chest out and pull your shoulders back. And there's times where I say it and he's like, I thought I was, I'm like, no dude, you're not. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, it's something I, that's getting better and he's working on it. But you know, the other thing is too, is that he was, um, very, very heavy for most of his life. And he and I have had this conversation. So he walked around kind of hunched over for a good portion of his life too. So even just in, re in regards to muscle memory, he has to actively not only build the strength, but also kind of retrain his body into what good, what a good, you know, postural stance would be. Yeah. I, th I think it's pretty straight across the board. There's a, um, most people, including myself, can use it. It, it's, it would be very hard to overdo. Um, I think most people need more work on, on the, the posture end and those, po I call them the posture muscles back there. Yeah. So sure. that's why I picked that one. But to, uh, going back to the push up, what um, I like the push up because if you can do them from your toes, if you, if you haven't done, if you can do push-ups and you don't do, I do them regularly, like yeah. a lot. I do lots of them. I did them today as a matter of fact. Um, but if you don't, for whatever reason, if you got away from them and you go back and do them, you'd be surprised how sore your core can get because uh -huh. it's a moving plank. You yeah. Know? And if you're doing. Well, and that's kind of why I put, put it on there because it really ends up being a, almost a full body exercise yeah. because you are bracing your core. You're using, pushing through the palms of your hands, working your chest, hitting your shoulders. Right, and then like, I mean, it's the whole, if you're, I always, even when I do it, I feel like even just doing this movement, pushing through the floor because I brace everything. I can even feel it in my lats when I'm squeezing my backside, you know, pushing through and it ends up essentially being, I think if you're doing it, properly and if you're able to do them from in that you know that military push-up position from your toes it really does end up being a full um full body exercise people always tell me every single week i have somebody that says to me every single week they say we're doing push-ups again we just did them last week i'm like and we're gonna do them next week 
and we're going to do them next week yeah. and we're going to probably do them next week. And there's even times like, especially in that rush hour class that I have, we'll do them. So right now I'm teaching rush hour Monday through Thursday. It's that 30 minute express class. And I would say probably two out of four of those classes, there is some variation of the push up. Number one, because there are about a million different ways you can do push ups. Whether it's changing hand position, um, but even for the people who need to modify it, I have people that are going off boxes, walls, barbells, if they're going from their knees. There's just a bunch of different ways that they're able to do it. And it ends up being something that your whole entire body ends up getting worked. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I don't think uh, you can do enough of them really. Yeah. I mean, unless maybe if you're in like the very, very beginning and you are like, for some reason, excessively sore, sure. you might want to take a rest, but that's where, you know, getting back into one of the completely other conversations that we had about needing to know your body um, for safety reasons. But I don't, I don't know that, I don't think that I've ever overdone it on pushups. No, no, I generally sure. do them three times a week. Yeah. About, a, you know, at least a hundred 120 push-ups per session usually like three sets of 40 even if i even if i can't do a straight 40 on the third set i'll do 20 take 10 seconds kind of not get 10 more out take a few seconds 10 more out but uh, eventually accumulating that many. i'm not saying in one set yeah so i mean that's 360 push-ups a week you know and it's a and, lot yeah so a couple sets of 10 you're gonna be fine right one, two, three, four, five. That was my number six. Okay. Number seven. Number seven, I was really torn with. This was this was where I had to pick a shoulder exercise, like a straight, well, I didn't have to, but in my head I had to. Yeah. Um, my straight shoulder exercise, I was torn between a um, dumbbell shoulder press and a lateral raise because I... I like the lateral raise just because I feel like it helps with that, like that rounded shoulder cap look. Um, but I also really like the pressing movement for strength purposes. Um, and I also think that by doing those shoulder presses, it's helpful when it comes to your chest presses, the push ups, and even like the planks and just building up your overall shoulder strength. So I was kind of torn between those two. I went with the, not only did I choose the press, but I specifically chose a standing single arm press. So obviously, I mean, oh, yeah. a, a barbell is great if you can do it, but some people can't handle, you know, a barbell. I don't, I personally don't, personally, I don't like a, the military press with the barbell. Um, I think that just because I have so many issues with my shoulders. I noticed that I noticed the, um, if I, like if I'm doing five, three, one, for example, and I have that military, the barbell press, um, for some reason, I think not for some reason, I know the reason, but I'm able to kind of tuck my elbows in a little bit differently when I'm using a dumbbell. I think I'm able to control it a little bit better opposed to when I have the, um, that barbell, I notice I get that impingement going and it's, I can feel it. It starts up in my shoulder and actually just because the way that everything is connected, it goes right down into um, the back end of my uh, tricep where my elbow joint connects. So for almost for that exact reason why, I mean, as much as I love the barbell press I, and, I, and I do love the single arm shoulder press, but so I went with that for, ease you can adjust the weight you can use a five pound dumbbell 10 pound whatever whatever you can more easily sure. customize the amount of weight you're using i think it's easier for people to focus on their posture when they're doing mm -hmm. one at a time as opposed yeah, to yeah i agree if it's heavy people tend to want to arch um and i like doing them um, standing as opposed to sitting because it you really have to brace your core Mm -hmm. um, really use your obliques and 
the whole side of your body has to be braced right down down to your leg but even sure. more specifically i and as opposed to the side raise i think you can generally use yeah. more weight in the press as, as opposed to the side oh raise. for sure so you're going to sure. overload the entire shoulder girdle including some of the traps i think it's going to cover a little more ground and i actually like if i'm going to do a single arm press i like using the kettlebell putting the weight on the back side of the shoulder and i like i just like the way it loads the shoulder a little bit better than the dumbbell so if if i have kettlebells available to me like if i'm doing mm -hmm. grotto i generally always choose the kettlebell if I'm in a regular commercial gym, then it's probably going to be done with a, a dumbbell. But I would say the standing single arm shoulder press. Well, and I like to, even with, with that, you can go, and even if it's a matter, if you are somebody who does have um, like aggravated shoulder muscle, if you just bring it in and change the position from where you're out here, to bringing it in front of you and starting your press from that different position, it can make all the difference. And then also too, and I've noticed this myself, if I'm trying to do, I mean, you already um, named all of the benefits of doing it from a standing position, but something else that I noticed when I'm in a seated position, not that I'm, I'm not using my legs like I would from a barbell bench press but you're still pushing off with your legs and feet and I feel like then I end up driving if, if it's um you know on the the seated the bench with the back support I end up driving back into the bench that way so by doing that standard and single arm it kind of takes away the um the ability to kind of even use any kind of leg drive that at least from that way, if you're not, as long as you're not doing a push press. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're not bending the knees and jumping them up. Yeah. Cool. That's all I had for the shoulder, shoulder area, because I figured we got a lot with the, the rowing and the, obviously the push. For sure. Yeah, that's what I got. Um, my tricep exercise, I picked skull crushers, like a lying, lying tricep extension. Yeah. Um, I really love dips, but I think that generally speaking, people don't quite have the strength and end up putting too much shoulder pressure on their shoulder girdle. So as much as I like dips, those went pretty quickly out the door and I went with a lying um, tricep extension just because I think that even if it's a matter of turning a, a dumbbell, a single dumbbell sideways and then... Um, doing it that way instead of with two dumbbells it seems like that's an exercise that people can generally execute pretty well i would say i i agree i i eliminated the dip doing dips although those are one of my favorites um but they can be difficult to do uh, they can be tough on the shoulders um so i eliminated the dips and then obviously i was going to go with some form of extension but uh, for the triceps, but, and I was debating the lying tricep extension or skull crusher, but I chose a, um, a tricep push down at the cable station only because I thought that might even be one step easier than even the skull crusher, or the extension because the way I like to do them, I really like the arms angled way back and not pulling the weight over the body. So people right. have a tendency to hold most of the weight in their shoulders or sure. they rotate their shoulders a lot when doing the extensions. So I, th I think for general population at the cable station, a tricep push down, although those can be, people can cheat them with the shoulders quite a bit too. Um, yeah, I notice I, as people start to fatigue because the tricep is such a small muscle, um, as people start to fatigue, I notice they start kind of trying to, they want to heave their body into it or they want to turn it into a straight arm pull down. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like your shoulder to your elbow. I'm like, you got to keep it right to your side. And they're like, you know, they're kind of, they give me the, the eye roll, like the, I just got caught kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was, that was definitely the other one. I, for half a second thought of a kickback, but then that kind of, not for any 
reason of difficulty did it go out the door, but I think that with those kickbacks, sometimes people turn it into a like a swinging momentum where they and they come up too high to the shoulder. So instead of maximizing the the working range of motion, they end up turning it into like a swing situation. And the thing where they are performing exorcisms. Extend the wrist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're the exorcists. So um, yeah, that the push down, that tricep. Yeah, some form of, some form of ex too. extension that would be pretty, mm -hmm. pretty simple. The kickback, I, I do them. The, to me, they're more of a finesse finishing move, you know, burn out. But yeah, because you can't overload. Pick, I mean, you can't build, you can't really, I don't, it's not a strength exercise. Like, no, it's more, I, of, I just think, it's a toning hypertrophy move to, yeah. but usually, I, I, I like to have it as a follow-up move to something that's already taxed the triceps pretty good. You know, use it as a secondary move. Yeah, so where they're kind of burnt out already, and that's that's like the final burner. Yeah. Um, that was number eight. We got two more. Yep. So on to the biceps. I just, I just went with the straight-up dumbbell bicep curl. Nothing yep. crazy. Um, Palms forward, elbows slightly forward, curl some dumbbells. Yeah, the only the only caveat um, to that is I like doing them. Um, I have nine out of ten times I do them um, always both arms together um, instead of alternating. Um, there's not the only I don't mind yeah. doing an alternating curl as long as both arms are in constant motion and it's not up down down up. yeah you'd be surprised no, i think that by doing that double curl. yeah you'd be surprised with that just a little bit of hesitation and rest at the bottom while the one arm's moving the other isn't the recovery mm -hmm. is pretty pretty quick so i'd rather keep the constant tension on on the muscle with uh both arms at the same time which you know we do most For of the sure. time anyway. but yeah i don't think you can you can't beat the, uh, you know, it's always going to come down. You want to work the biceps, it's nine out of ten times. curling. Down to a curl. You got to flex the muscle. So keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And then number ten. <laughs> number ten. So this was my, this is where I had to pick a ab slash core exercise. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I just went with a straight up plank. I just went with the plank. I, you can go from you can go from your forearms. You can go full plank, um, like a full arm plank. If you want to hit a little bit more full body, if you're in that forearm plank, you're working your abdominal muscles a little bit. But I think that it, from a simplicity standpoint, even you know, because I thought about even crunches. I'm like, no, people pull on their neck. They don't actually use their stomach muscles to crunch. Yeah. So by being in that plank position, even if they have to, even if they oh. drop down oh. their knees, go for modified. I'm losing you. Plank there. I still think that 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 would be better than most other. You there still? Uh, yeah, you're frozen up. I think I unfroze. Am I back now? Now you are, yeah. So why don't you start over about the, the plank you were just saying, like 30 seconds back. I, I was just saying that I think that for when it comes to like a core exercise, too many people will pull on their head for a crunch. If they're doing a bicycle crunch, they got themselves here and they're kind of just moving back and forth. They're not actually using their abdominal muscles. By being in that, um, that plank position, they're getting work without having to do any kind of actual movement. Yeah. And yeah, for all those reasons, I, I, I came up with the exact same thing. I was debating uh, the full sit up. And I'm like, well, yeah. That but there's so many people who can't even sit up all the way, you know? Yeah. So then I thought the crunch, and I'm like, well, the crunch isn't effective for the entire core. Uh, 
Um, doesn't really engage the obliques all that much, lower, right. lower, lower back. I love the hanging leg raise, but it's kind of difficult. Not about you. you know, most people can do it. And then I'm like, well, you can do a sitting knee tuck, but those, you'd have to do a million of them. And uh, again, right. most people end up using their hips instead of engaging their core. So the plank just seemed, as you already said, you just get in position and it's forced, the, the entire yeah. Core is forced to work the low back, the obliques, the abs, and I always consider as part of the core of the lats, part of the back, almost as that connector of that entire upper body. Um, you know, even with doing a plank, you really have to. Most exercises, as we talked about earlier, you really have to engage those back muscles. And I, I would even consider the the low lats as part of part of the core because mm -hmm. it's such a you use it to brace. You know, if you're doing a hanging leg raise and you start swinging, the easiest way to stop swinging is it's to pull your shoulders down and retract your back to right. absorb the the motion. So, sure. I would say what well, just about probably like seven or eight things we had almost the exact same thing. I mean, yeah. other than I think I said the goblet squat, you said the box squat, but and I made the list over again. I would, I would have definitely said the box squat. Um, you said the push up. I said the pull aparts. Um, and that, pretty much everything else is, you know, maybe the row and the body row, but it was some form of row. Yeah, either way, we're rolling. Yeah, it's all. It's all. Those are pretty standard stuff. The only thing I would maybe add to it is, I would stay in the eight to 15 rep range as a general yeah. rule of thumb. Sure. And as far as tempo, I would do a, uh, a steady tempo. I wouldn't yeah, like be explosive. I wouldn't be too slow. I would take a moderate, you know, one, two, three, like a one, one, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, just nice and steady. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's also going to, then you don't have to use as much weight. Because you're going to get, because of the time under tension, you're going to be, it's going to exhaust the muscle. So you don't have to overload. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yep. So I think if anybody was looking to write something for themselves, you're, you're going to the gym, you don't know what to do. You're going on vacation. You don't have access to a lot of equipment. You take this list and, and uh, you can use this over and over. It's never going to go out of style. You get a lot of mileage out of it. For sure. All right. That's Joy. funny that we came up with, although I don't know why I'm acting like I would be shocked, but that there was just so many of them that were like similar spot on. Yeah. And for, I mean, but it was all for, for the right reasons. Knowledgeable reasons. Yeah. You got to remember under the circumstances, under the context of the scenario that we set up. Now, if it was something different, we we're talking about pure strength. Power lifting. Or yeah. we're saying, you know, for you or me or somebody a little more intermediate and advanced, well, then then the whole thing would change, you know. I'd, oh, yeah. Then this whole thing goes out the door. Sure. We'd be talking about, you know, a whole slew of different exercises. And, you know, it, even if we had to, if we expanded it to 15 or chopped it down to seven, then you're going to sure. have to, that would change the list pretty much, you know, the, and, and that, that would even... That would be pretty interesting too, you know, if you had to. I was actually, did you work. notice my, my papers here? I'm gazing, trying to figure out which three I would chop. Yeah, you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to put some, if you had to put three on the chopping block, then you might have to pick something that's going to cover, cover more things, you know. You could take something like, you know, the incline press and put it at a 45 degree and try to kill two birds with one stone there. Yeah. Then that becomes a chest and shoulder exercise. Sure. You can take your, you know, um, your rows and turn them into underhand, you know, barbell rows or dumbbell rows to cover the biceps a little more to engage the biceps and right. You know, stuff like that. Huh. You could do a parallel press instead of a chest press to hit more triceps. You'd have to get a little more strategic about how you'd want to over overlay things. And then on the same token, if you expanded to 15 and you were able to pick five more. Well, that just know, opens the door right up. Sure. Where, where would you, where, where, and then I think it would come down to the individual where the, where the individual would need more work. You know, yeah, you definitely want to put some more lower body. Do they need more core work? Do they need more, 
arm work. You know? Well, that's the nice thing too. Like, um, as much as I love the classes, one of the great benefits of doing the individualized one-on-one -on -one training is that we really have an opportunity to cater to that individual. When it's even our small group, I mean, the small group, unless it is a like a private small group where they maybe have same goals, like maybe the two of like two, three people or whatever, they all want to focus on accessory work for powerlifting or whatever. But for the most part, if it's just a regular general small group training, it's kind of like a class. So it's not necessarily specified to one person. The good thing about the one-on-one -on -one individual personal training is that you have that individualized plan and you can cater to just what that person is looking to achieve. Or maybe they don't know that they're looking to achieve it, but maybe the areas that you know we see they could use some improvement um, strength-wise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. All right, Joe, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so stay I'm interested to yeah. what other trainers what we up with. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, this week, Wednesday, when I go live, uh, Wednesday live, I'm going to be joined by Brian Sperduti of Genesis Personal Training. He's going to come on. Oh, with nice. Me. He's always maybe, fun to talk to. Yeah, maybe I'll throw that past him. Maybe put him on the spot and make him pick 10, uh, 10 exercises. See what he comes up with. I can't, I can imagine um, just in probably be the exact same. Fact. I was just going to say, he'll probably come back with the same list. The only other thing I could think that he might throw in there are the hip thrusters. I know he's a pretty big fan of those. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I but, would tend to agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll throw that past him. See what he, see what he comes up with. Yeah. Cool. So, all right, gang. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe and Catch you on the next podcast. Bye.